Welcome, everybody, to the Big Bass Podcast. My name is Ken Duke. I'm here with my partners, Terry Battisti and Nathan Benson. And we've got a fabulous show for you tonight, a little bit of a departure from what you've often seen on the Big Bass Podcast. We have a guest who's going to join us. And this guy has been the witness to some of the greatest and most important history in the world of big bass fishing. Terry, tell them what we've got planned here. I, this is this is going to be a show, a conversation, an interview that I've wanted to do for my whole life. Uh, tonight, we have Jim Brown. Jim Brown is, without a doubt, uh, the guy when it comes to talking about Florida bass and the San Diego lakes. Uh, Jim is a native San Diegan whose life and career placed him at the center of what many anglers know as California's big bass explosion. His father was one of a number of local sportsmen who supported and participated in that wildly successful experiment to bring Florida strain largemouth to San Diego's tiny upper Otay Reservoir. Jim was a bass crazy 13 year old at the time when those fish arrived in 1960. That same year, he made it his goal one day to manage the Nine Reservoir San Diego uh, City Lakes program. And in 1974, he got his dream job, which he held for 29 years, which was operating the San Diego City Lakes program. So, folks, without further ado, here's our conversation with Jim Brown. Jim, welcome to the program. Thanks a lot, Terry. It's great to be here with you and Ken. Yeah. So we, you know, we want to talk to you about, you know, your experience with, uh, you know, the introduction of Florida's into San Diego lakes uh, that eventually spread throughout California. Uh, I mean, you, you essentially grew up with Orville Ball and your dad was good friends with Orville. So can you kind of give us, you know, uh, some of those experiences or things that you remember that stand out in your mind? Yeah, I think the things that stand out is uh, you know, my dad was in the Federal Employees Rod and Reel Club. Mm -hmm. There were no bass clubs at that time. So we're going back into the 50s, uh, early 60s. And in terms of my dad's relationship to Orville, my dad was one of those very avid, well-known bass fishermen who supported the efforts that he had going on on the city lakes. The Florida oh, bass crap. story is one of those efforts. And... Uh, so it, I was very fortunate because I grew up as a little kid. Uh, I loved fishing at Upper Otai, and I remember that all the fish in there had to be rote owned and killed off so that the Florida bass could be brought here. Wow. Jim, we know your dad was a, a very avid bass guy. When you were growing up, obviously you were immersed in that fishing culture. Uh, were you more into the trout, the bass? What was your passion? Well, it was everything. Mainly, I just wanted to be out with my dad fishing. And so I actually had dreams of that before I was old enough to go. Uh, they took me uh, probably when I was four years old. And over a period of time, I eventually had a rod in my hands. Instead of them handing me a rod with a fish on it, I got to fish on my own. And we did everything. We went to Mission Bay and we, you know, we caught saltwater fish in there. We went to Sunset Cliffs and caught saltwater fish. But the lakes were really my dad's passion. Uh, he would uh, he, he retired from the Navy on a military discharge after the war, on a, not a military discharge, on a medical discharge after the war. And so he became a house painter and handyman. And every Saturday was a day at the lakes and every Wednesday was a day at the lakes. So we were out there at the lakes all the time. I mean, in, 1955, I was eight years old, and I was at the very first opening of El Capitan and the very first opening of Sutherland. Wow. wow. Amazing. To, to have such an experience as a young person and then to, to grow into it and to find a career there, I can't think of anybody else who who's had that kind of life experience. I, I envy you. You know, it's, it's really crazy, and I'll tell you a story that illustrates just how crazy it was. In the eighth grade, the outdoor agencies here, the, uh, the Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Fish and Game, they all got together, and they put on an outdoor careers conference for eighth graders. Now, I was 13 years old at the time. 
And so the way it worked, you went around each table, you talked to the rangers and the game wardens, and you found out about their jobs, what they did, what were the educational requirements. And uh, at the end of the conference, they brought a microphone around to every student and asked, you know, what what really struck you? What do you want to do? So it was, you know, as they came down the line to me, half the kids wanted to be a national park ranger. Some of them wanted to be a game warden. They got to me. I stood up. I pointed at Orville Ball, who was managing the lakes at the time. And I said, I want Mr. Ball's job. So I was 13 years <laughs> later. 14 years later, I had it. And to be perfect, <laughs> I think I really knew that I wanted his job before I turned 13. That's well, crazy. So, so, so he, he saw you as a threat right away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think they saw me as a really pretty handy tool. Uh, they, they utilized me in every way that they could, uh, whether it was guiding visiting media or the local media. Uh, I was the guy that did that when they went to Lake Sutherland. When they had the Mrs. America uh, pageant here for one year, they had me guide Mrs. America and her family at Otai Lake. So, you know, I mean, they had me guide city council members. So I was pretty well known by the time, let's say, I was 15. Amazing. So impressive. Well, you know, you gotta, you've got to imagine, here I am, a kid in San Diego, and... I really developed my love for reading with Outdoor Life, Sports of Field, uh, f Field and Stream. And, of course, I had to hide the Argosy and the True magazines from my mom because they were kind of racy, but they still had good stories on fishing and hunting. So I'm a kid in San Diego reading about Ted Trueblood telling how you hunt cottontails in the snow with a brace of beagles. Those are the kinds of things <laughs> that I lived for. Oh, Come on, that's... Jason Lucas. Forget True Blood. Jason Lucas, a bass guy. That's that's our guy. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I had Uncle Homer Circle out here for quite a bit of time. So, no, I, I did. Uh, I worked a little bit with everybody, but I was just it was anything outdoors early on. Uh, and of course, you were fishing for trout, but it it. I kind of became a bass fanatic right around 12 years old. And that's when I had the good fortune of a traveling salesman and his wife, a Campbell Soup district manager, handing me some plastic worms. And that, ah. that changed absolutely everything in my fishing, my dad's fishing, and fishing in San Diego County. Now, plastic worms were here, but if, if you look back at that period of time, they might have been a Burke's flex crawler covered with beads, spinners, uh, three gold hooks, you know, all manner of things that made them pretty unattractive. And so what we found was that you could go to Herders in Wasika, Minnesota, and you could order a gross of plastic worms for right around six dollars and eighty cents as i recall and that's what my dad would do is order those plastic worms to come in and that changed fishing totally yeah yeah it, the, the plastic worm was still even in the in the mid 60s was still a mystery um you know and, and it sounds like the uh the old campbell soup guy gave you a real quick uh, lesson on how to use the things. <laughs> it, That's wonderful. It was, it, it was amazing. That's awesome. So <laughs> let, let's get back to, to Orville Ball and your dad. And, and you, you said you were there when they wrote Known Upper Otai. Well, I, I wasn't there, but I, 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 I had been fishing Upper Otai and loving it. Uh -huh. And I, I had a job at the time on the lake. It was kind of a uh, freelance job. And that was, I would have a piece of line about 12 to 24 inches long with a fly on it. And I would dip that fly in the cracks in the rocks and catch green sunfish. I then carried two coffee cans with me. One had perfect size green sunfish for a dime. And those that were a little larger, a little small were a nickel. And I would sell them up and down the line of fishermen. <laughs> 
an entrepreneur at the age of 12. <laughs> Actually, that was before 12 because it was, uh, you know, I, I might have been eight or nine then. And so it was it was really crazy. My wow. very in-depth involvement from a very long, very young age with most of these lakes. Amazing. Now, we've always heard the story that uh, Orville Ball, Ray Boone, the Major League Baseball player, and Rolla Williams, the outdoor writer, were out on Hawthorne, I guess, fishing. And, Henshaw. And, Henshaw, I'm sorry. Uh, Henshaw. And, and, and Ray Boone asks, why aren't these fish as big as the ones I catch in spring training when I'm in Florida? Is that is that the real story, Jim, or is that kind of apocryphal? You know, that is exactly the story as told by both Orville and Rolla. I never talked to Bob Boone, but uh, in terms of Orville and Rolla, yes, they repeated that story as to how it came about. And uh, I heard it so many times, I have to believe that it's very, very accurate. Very Terry and I, I, I speculated to Terry, you know, I said, if, if there were no spring training in Florida back then, if there were no Grapefruit League, but had uh, Ray Boone played in Arizona in the, in the Cactus League, there might not be any Florida bass in California these days. That might, yeah, that might be. No, actually, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, as a, as a biologist, uh, or Orville was really fascinated with, with some things, and that brought up for him as a biologist, what he described as the debate between nature and nurture. And to elaborate on that, uh, he had the benefit of a man, you know, still regarded as America's greatest fisheries biologist, and, and that was Carl Hubbs. And he had an office out sure. of Scripps. Sure. And so Orville drove, and Orville told me this story personally several times, you know, that he, he didn't really know, but he thought it was a great, uh, you know, great thing to look into after that trip. Crop, they were crappie fishing. I don't think they caught any bass at Henshaw. They were crappie fishing. And they, uh, it, it just struck a chord with Orville, and that caused him to want to go and, and, and see Ray Hubbs. And as I recall, Ray Hubbs had done a paper on the taxonomic differences of Florida strain and largemouth and, and northern strain, largemouth black bass at Eastern Michigan University. I'm sure that with Terry's files, he's probably got that in a file. But the fact is, <laughs> Orville spoke to him, and neither of them knew what might happen. But Hub's words to Orville were, well, it's worth a try. And that's how it started. Yeah, a, a no. different era. Uh, things like that. I just can't imagine something like that happening today, uh, especially on a large, oh, no, they'd large be in, public They'd be in jail today. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, they'd definitely be in jail. And they should uh, be. As a, you know, as a native Floridian, they so should much. be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know you were a native Floridian, so, but I'm not going to hold did... that against you. We just. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I like to tell Ken is that we took from Florida and made it better, you know, because, oh, so, hey, yeah. you know, between Texas and Florida, <laughs> they don't they haven't produced as many big fish as California. Texas, <laughs> Texas, <laughs> Texas, you know, Lone Star State is not a slogan. It is a Yelp rating, gentlemen. That's all I'll say about Texas right now. Well, uh, I was with Larry when we went to Hodges and provided the biologists from Texas with the broodstock for their Florida bass program. And the reason they came to us is their studies showed that our bass, our, our Florida strain bass that we kidnapped from Florida, were going to be better stocked than the fish they found in Florida. Wow. Now, you mentioned Larry. That's Larry Botroff, your close friend and, and a biologist who... You and you and Larry Botroff have seen more gigantic bass than any other human beings on the face of the earth. Well, I will say that Larry has. I was in the office too much in my job to see all of them, but uh, <laughs> I've seen plenty. Uh, we've been on shocking excursions many times late at night. Um, oh. Once you realize Larry's dedication to his job, 
you understood that no matter how cold it was or how late it was, and I'm talking three, four in the morning, he always thought maybe if he got another hundred bass, it would improve the quality of his data when he did his studies. So when he did his extrapolation, whereas the Department of Fish and Game would have a creel census of a few percentage of all anglers and then try to create policy or regulations based on that, Larry was working with 80 to 90 percent creel census data. So, so our sense of uh, confidence in all of that was so superior to anything I've ever seen uh, th there's just nothing to compare. So let me go off on a tangent here. Did they ever shock up a world record fish? No. Wow. No, okay. we shocked. I was going to go there if you didn't, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, shocked up a lot of really big fish, uh, but nothing, nothing over 20 that I recall. And, and I wasn't with him on all the trips, but mm -hmm. Larry debriefed me after most trips, and I got the reports that he would put together. So, yeah, none of the, uh, you know, the world records didn't show up. The world records mainly showed up in the minds of some of our poachers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at the risk of jumping around too much here, Jim and Terry, um, when was reel, it that, reel me in, that a can reel me in? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I find that I'm the one who's jumping around here because there are about a thousand <laughs> questions I'd like to ask you, and uh, I can no longer keep them in a meaningful order. Um, <laughs> at, at what point was it that you thought, "Hey, we just might have a world record swimming around out here, uh, and we're and we're going to get it"? What year would that have been? 73 with Zimmerly's fish, which, by the way, folks, is behind Jim. Just above Jim's head is a replica of the Dave Zimmerly fish from, what, June 23, 1973, 20 pounds, 15 ounces? But when did you think, yeah, a world record is in our grasp? Well, first of all, that's replica number eight. And so Lions ah. and O'Haver Taxidermy, which did outstanding work, had done those, and Dave Zimmerly got a commission on every copy. So this was number wow. eight. I think they got up to maybe 14, 15 copies uh, that were sold at, at one point or another. Um, there's one other copy that's with the San Diego City Lakes program. This one was actually given to my boss in the Gulf Lakes Division of the Park and Recreation Department. And a lot of people don't realize we manage the city's golf courses, including Torrey Pines and Balboa Park, in addition to the lake. So we were the Golf Lakes Division, which people tease us and called us the Fish and Chips Division, but we got over it. And in, in terms of the things that, you know, we did, my boss did 90% golf, I did 90% lakes, and we overlapped 10% and helped each other out when we had to. And... The bass was given to him by the concessionaire on the lakes. So this was not one of the, the, well, the city has one copy still in its possession. And so the reason I have this is when my boss died a few years back, his son came to me and he said, Jim, would you like that bass that my dad had on his wall? And I said, oh, I don't, yeah, sure, but, you know, you don't want it. And he says, my dad always told me he didn't, you know, he didn't deserve that bass. You did. You're the one that that ran the lakes for him and he wanted you to have it. So he's passed away and we want you to have it. And that's how I ended up with this bass probably 10 years after I retired. But anyway, tell me that question again. I'll get Very right nice back sentiment. to it. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> was it, was it the moment you heard about the Zimmerly fish, the moment you no. saw the Zimmerly fish, just that you had, you, so it was before that you felt like you had a shot well, of a record. There was a, Bass over 15 pounds caught very early on um, that made some of us scratch our heads and say, anything's possible. We were used to the lake record in all of our reservoirs, except for Barrett, which produced a very large northern. In all of our lakes, the records were hovered somewhere between maybe six and a half and seven and a half, you know, close to eight pounds. 
And so those were our standard northern strain bass. Um, we started seeing big fish, and I remember I was away at college at Humboldt State in 1968 when a guy named Ed Nagel caught the first nine-pound bass, and that was at Lower Otai. So that's eight years after those fry went into Upper Otai in 1960. My dad caught I also, the second I also bass. have – go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. my dad caught the second bass over nine pounds, and I'm up at going to school at Humboldt State, and uh, my mom sends me a, a photo of my dad with this bass and a clipping from the newspaper. And so that was the second one, and I had just finished two years of running the lake at Otai and seeing some, some big fish, and uh, it, it just became remarkable. The records just tumbled left and right. The Floridas were growing. Uh, I set the record and held the record at Sutherland for a few months, and I think that was seven and a half or seven and three quarters. And so you just saw these records tumbling like this, and you knew the Florida bass, they were just taken over. And then when that 15-pounder caught by a poacher was hung on the fence, at that point I kind of said, you know, anything can happen with this. And that's the Hamley fish, right? Yeah. Yes. That that yeah. that yeah. was the one that was that was really a a, a big controversy and and uh, a remarkable fish. And so from that point on, um, we saw, you know, big fish. And to to your point, Ken, seeing Zimmerly's fish so close to the world record, you. You just had a real sense that anything really can happen. Now, I was a bass fanatic for many years, but but my I, I was like a meteor. I, I came and went pretty fast. By the time I was 20, the bass fishing was less fascinating to me than it was from the age of 12 to 20, and absolutely crazy when I was 15 that you know, everyone said if I fell and hit my head and split it open, bass would tumble out. That was all I could <laughs> think about. And I fished hard. I worked hard at it. And then after that, I kind of changed in terms of, of perspective. But, you know, it, it just, it changed things. I knew that in Florida, they weren't catching a lot of 18 and 20 pound bass. Now, we didn't get a lot of those, you know, but, you know, Sandberg had the 18, 12 at San Vicente. And we were seeing 15, 16 pound fish. And it, it was just remarkable to see so many big fish over that period of time. Yeah. What was it? Bates caught a 1710 or a 1714? 1714, I think. And yeah. Yeah. Sandberg, 189. Yep. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, and those fish really started to, to roll in. Uh, well, of course, uh, as far as the fish over, 18 pounds the first recollection i have of any any fish over 18 pounds in california was the zimmerly fish but i guess in that year you had some poachers or some rumors of some other fish 18 and a quarter 18 14 and of course uh one of our our favorite um uh bizarrely interesting guys phil j who caught one every day i think for like a month bizarre and interesting are very good adjectives <laughs> the late perhaps not so great phil jay yeah well he he was he, he was quite a character um and i mean it was it was bizarre and i will mention he was on your florida fish and game commission and uh he uh <laughs> Thing, <laughs> there you go, Ken. <laughs> so, Jim, there's there's no there's no need for you and Batista to gang up on me. That's just uncalled for. Well, I was trying to be kind to you because he was such a leader. Um, he, the first time, I got a, a call from Phil, and anyone who knew Phil knew he talked kind of like a guy getting ready to go into Studio 54. So, I mean, it was like, hey, baby. And it, everybody was baby. And 
you know, he, he wanted to, to visit. That's how Batiste talks. And he was, <laughs> he sent me the information indicating that he was on the Florida Fish and Game Commission and that he was going to be returning to San Diego. He was from San Diego. He was going to be returning to San Diego. And he wanted to make sure that I gave him a pass so that any lake employees or game wardens knew it was okay for him to be there at all times. Um, and I've had a lot of bizarre requests from the media. That was one of the better ones. And uh, so I told him, well, you know, that's, that's really not going to be possible. Uh, I'll try to accommodate you as a member of the media based on our own policy for that. But I really can't do what you're asking. And then I got a call about, I don't know, two weeks later. And he said, I'd like to come into your office. And I said, sure. And he said, uh, we talked a little bit. And he goes, you work for Pete, right? And I said, no, I work for Don Mackey in the other office over here. And he goes, no, you work for Pete. And I, I was bewildered. And he goes, Pete Wilson's the mayor. Don't you work for him? <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I that had never occurred to me that I worked for the mayor. But I, I guess in a way, yeah, all, all city employees, I suppose, kind of work. City for employees, sure, yeah. And yeah. he goes, and you're telling me, meets my buddy, and you're telling me uh, that you can't accommodate me for these things that I'm asking for. And I said, no, but, you know, if Pete's your buddy, let me make a phone call. It turns out that Pete Wilson had an employee in his office who was a friend of mine to the day by the name of Rich Garcia. So I said, well, hang on a second. So I picked up the phone and I, I said, hey, Rich, Jim Brown here. There's a friend of Pete's here in the office by the name of Phil J who would like to get things straightened out with the mayor. And when I turned around and looked, all I could see was the back of Phil running out the door. He literally <laughs> jumped up out of the chair after trying to play this poor, poorly, poor bluff on me and disappeared. But he, he never really disappeared for long. And then he reemerged and he came to me and he said, uh, I want you to give me the concession on Lake Miramar and I'll run it. <laughs> And I can charge a hundred dollars a day and we'll set the world record and we'll do this and I'll make a million dollars for the city. And I mean, it was crazy, but that was the experience that you had with Phil. And, uh, he, he was an interesting character. He tried to get away with anything that he could. And, uh, I would say that, uh, he eponymously named his tackle company. It was the Outlaw Tackle Company. And he became the number one supplier <laughs> of Golden Shiners and Crawdads in San Diego County. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. Want to, we want to revisit the Phil J story with you another time and do that and do a deep dive on um, Mr. J because for the folks who aren't familiar with some of his claims in Florida and in California, they're fascinating. American right. Bass Fisherman is where he got his start in, uh, in, in trying to fraud people out of uh, out of things. Uh, yeah, and it's an amazing it, amazing it, story. It's it it is a great story, and I, I'll look forward to the evening we can sit and talk about that. <laughs> It'll be good. Oh, that'll be fun. <laughs> there, Jim Brown, you know so much. You you you've seen. You're just uh, apart from the apart from the history you made. Uh, you're you've been a, such an amazing witness to so much history, and that's in, in heading back here to the San Diego Lakes and some of the stuff that was happening there. Um, the first Florida bass, of course, went into Upper Otai Lake, Upper Otai Reservoir. Tell us about when uh, Orville Ball and, and the folks there decided to transplant them. How that was done? Okay, uh, so I think that's a, a great story too. Well. Uh, Orville began working on the project and immediately was opposed by the Department of Fish and Game, which opposed the Florida bass being brought to California until they proved to be enormously successful, at which time they were happy to <laughs> have played a role in bringing them here. And I can say that with absolute certainty because 
they were very opposed and they blocked it. And we had the good fortune in San Diego that Dr. David Jessup, a local uh, optometrist, maybe ophthalmologist, Dave Jessup was on, well, he was the chairman of the County Fish and Wildlife Commission, and he was on the state's Fish and Game Commission. And so he was the one who did the work behind the scenes on behalf of Orville and the city of San Diego, in which basically the commission overruled staff. That never goes well with staff. And so they were forced to go along with the, the transplant of those Florida strain largemouth. And so the first fish came in 1959, and the state pathologist ordered them all destroyed because uh, he found ick, which is a fairly common uh, problem if you have an aquarium. And uh, not, not an unusual uh, problem, but one that allowed them justifiably to destroy those fish. So it was not until 1960 that Orville, with the help of the Navy, flying a plane from Pensacola, Florida, was able to bring some fish in and get those fish into Upper Otai. And uh, they, they began growing at a pretty good rate. Now, the only thing that they had to compete with, the Rotenone had killed everything but the bullheads. And there weren't a lot of bullheads, but there were a few that showed up later. Maybe a few green sunfish, which are also a very tough fish. But we didn't see any bluegill, northern strain bass, or, or crappie that had also been in there at one time. So those fish had really no competition. And they went into the lake. They grew, and they, after their first spawn, they began taking those fish out. And I think that was probably maybe in 18 months to 24 months after they first went in. Now, I wasn't there when they went in, but I was there. When yeah, you'd have been just first. 14, 15. Well, you, you'd have been just uh, 12, 13 when they went in. Yeah, I, I wasn't there. I, they were not. They were not real big, uh, but I don't know. I couldn't say. Fishing Game has that data. Larry probably has that data, and we can try to get it from him because I, uh, I'm not going to guess at anything that I tell you when I answer a question, and uh, I just don't Thank do you. that. And so uh, those fish went in, <coughs> they reproduced, and at that point they had local fishermen come for a catch out. And fish and game did participate in that. So there were fish and game biologists on hand and city staff. And in order to catch the fish, and Upper Otai at the time had a lot of rocks and sticks, and netting fish wasn't very effective. We didn't have a shock boat at the time. And so what they did is invited uh, well-known local fishermen. My dad being one of them brought me along. And there was a certain amount of grumbling from people that what's this kid doing here on a school day fishing? But I think I caught enough fish to satisfy most of the people there. And uh, there was, you know, a, a rather horrific start to this. Would you like me to share that with you? Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're into horror. <laughs> well, this was a horror. And this is a little known uh, episode in the history of Florida bass. The uh, city sent a bunch of garbage pails and a bunch of trash cans, brand new aluminum cans, down to the dam keeper at Lower Otai Lake and said, hey, we're going to need these for a fish transfer that we're going to do at Upper Otai. And we need them on hand and we need, you know, water in them halfway up in the garbage cans and halfway up in the trash cans because those, and they were the big garbage pails because what's going to happen, we're going to have those everywhere along the shoreline. As fishermen catch bass, they'll put them in the garbage pail and runners will come pick up the garbage pail, put a new gar put another garbage pail there, dump the garbage pail into the drum. And then the fish in the drum will be put in a holding pen so the biologists can check them, weigh, measure. Uh, they weren't marked at that time, as I recall, though a few were tagged. And so that was the process. But around, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 o'clock in the morning, 
they realized that the bass were going belly up. These prized bass were going belly up. So what had happened, the dam keeper thought, these new cans will be great down on the lake. I'll just use the cans we've been using for garbage and, you know, as in the outhouses that stretched around the lake. So all the garbage pails that we used had once had chemicals in them that there were pro there was residue most likely collected in the bottom of them wow filled them with water oh the indignity you california guys don't know how to treat a bass <laughs> <laughs> well well keep in mind they were florida bass uh, <laughs> that's what i'm saying jim that's my entire argument <laughs> no so anyway after that bit of a disaster they got it squared away and uh changed changed the operation around and fish went in a state uh, tanker truck and began to be moved around to the lakes and now at that time lake miramar had been closed it was a, it was a new lake it's the last reservoir built by the city of san diego and i think it was completed in probably 61. so it got those florida bass all right and the state had also moved some uh, bluegill red ear and threadfin shad in there. And that kind of, you know, got the ball rolling. I couldn't tell you the order of all of the other lakes, but Lower Otai was one of the first. And then they went elsewhere. Hodges, San Vicente, Sutherland, El Capitan. And now Murray uh, and, Mir and, and also Murray. So those fish got right. distributed everywhere but Upper Ot but Barrett. Okay, Barrett was left alone. Were these fish already getting trout? Well, I'm sorry, were these lakes already getting trout? Yes. Well, point? not not every lake. Uh, the lakes that received not not Hodges, obviously. No, San Vicente, Murray, and Miramar were the ones that got trout, and uh, that was one of the really terrific arguments from your Florida anglers, who said. Well, we could grow fish to that size, too, if we were feeding them trout. I mean, look at all those big fish. So catching. true. They're all full of trout. And then we had the... Gene vitamin Dupre. T. Vitamin T, Jim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then all of a sudden, we have the Gene Dupress fish come out of a lake that did not Hodges, have trout. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And... Uh, Touche. And, you know, it, it, some it's of like, the folks you know, in Florida... A shiner, a shiner is just as good as a trout. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, and one if fish you, out of one lake without trout, come on. Is good enough proof. <laughs> it's certainly evidence. Touche, sir. Touche. Touche. <laughs> so, oh, man. Sir, in fact, it one. could be better proof. Yeah, and, and so... You know, those fish got distributed around, and as I mentioned earlier, records began to tumble. People, you know, got excited, and the entire complexion of the San Diego City Lakes program really began to take on its own aura, and uh, it, it stayed that way for a long time. Eventually, the Department of Fish and Game which was very opposed early on, and they opposed Orville outfitting a pumper truck, and they stopped him from moving fish on his own. And so they wanted it to be entirely in their domain, which I think is appropriate that it would be in their domain since they manage the resources for the state. And pretty soon they were coming. Um, we were thinking we'd put some of these bass in clear like, you know, uh, we're going to send a truck down. Can you facilitate that? Well, Orville was gone in by clearly, then. Clearly, Casitas, uh, Castaic, uh, you know. Well, they Casitas and, got them and, and Clear Lake got them in 1968. Uh, is That's the year that they were taken up north and up to Ventura. So, right. I actually have yeah, the, those, and, the paper clippings. Those, those well, fish began moving around and having the same impact everywhere else. And it was, uh, I know it was striking. I mean, I mean, I got calls from around the world 
uh, both from fishermen planning trips here, uh, as well as agencies trying to get their hands on some Florida bass. And I got that, a weird question for you, Jim. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say at, at that point in time, uh, we had no authority. I mean, at no point in time did we really have authority to do what Fish and Game had to do as a regulatory agency. And so uh, I, I worked closely. I had a good relationship with Fish and Game. You know, Larry Botroff was the Fish and Game biologist um, until I hired him away. And he would have probably not left the state were it not for the fact that they felt that he'd done enough work on fish in San Diego and that he should drive, he lives near San Vicente, that he should drive past a lake that he surveyed on a regular basis to go to Riverside and study the Stevens kangaroo rat for them. So he did that four (laughs) days a week. So four days a week, he was there. The rest of the time, he was on his own time continuing all of his bass research on the lakes in San Diego. That's wow. dedication. And then I hired him away. Uh, as a, as a, I can't believe you you pulled him away from the kangaroo rat. Well, no. But uh, kudos to you. Uh, it, it, it was crazy. Here, here's my weird question for you. Um, Do I need to store bass or my sand? wife's in the other room? If this is something between you and I, Ken, just go ahead. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> It's, it's it's totally totally G rated, I promise. Right. But it's a weird question, maybe a weird question. Um, these are these are Florida bass. They're not northern bass, so a lot of people are probably finding them a little more challenging to catch, right? Than a a northern bass. Um, these fish are eating your trout, which I imagine is a put and take fishery. Yeah, and I'm sure some people enjoyed catching those trout, and they're eating them. Um, all these big fish are coming coming along. That's got to put additional fishing pressure on the lakes that's got to cause additional manpower needs on your part was there anybody in this era the late 60s early mid 70s and on who thought you know this florida bass thing is not working out this is not what we want was there any of that attitude not at all uh first of all we always had robust attendance on the lakes so you know in the old days it was you know great for crappie and bluegill i mean People flocked to the lakes just to go fishing. They were they were popular. We had really good attendance. And so, you know, that didn't factor in. What well, did fact- the, the lakes the lakes were only open three days a week and they staggered on the weekday that they were open. That's correct. So that would help that would help with the, the work or the workers. We didn't um, we did not have to add staff as a result of the bat of the Florida bass. Not at all. Mm-hmm. You didn't have so, to bump up the constabulary just to deal with Phil J. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, th- there were there were a lot of issues that 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 honestly were not handled. I mean, everyone and actually it was against a lot of fish at night here, so most of the poaching was going on at night. But San Diego County was unique in not permitting night fishing, and quite frankly. Because these are all water supply reservoirs, legitimately San Diego County should have prevailed on that issue when you have primary water supply reservoirs involved. But the state wanted consistency um, throughout its counties. Um, you know, I, I, I won't add an editorial comment there. The uh, oh, We love editorial comments. Well, I, 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 this is... <laughs> Yeah, it's not worth it for me at this point to really try to recreate old battles with the state. But it was kind of a thing where it really injured our ability to control what was happening on the lakes. So when it was no longer against state law to fish at night on the lakes, which it had been, it was open game. Because the city was not covering it. You know, we didn't have rangers with authority at the time to issue citations. When you consider that of the city lakes, three are in the city limits, seven are outside the city limits, the San Diego Police Department's not going to get involved. So we were in this netherland, of, you know, of just a catch-22. And people had their way. 
uh, with the lakes, I think they probably are right now. Yeah. So when, you know, as a kid, I remember reading the, the, the Liars paper, the Western Outdoor News, um, and, and seeing, you know, 10, 12, 13-pound fish caught on float, Zeke's floating bait, for example. Um, you know, you, you realize that the guy probably hooked a trout and the tr trout got eaten by a bass. When so a Zeke, I'm sorry, a Zeke's floating bait. I'm not familiar with that. That's kind of some kind of trout cheese bait. Yeah, or we'll send you a bar, uh, a, a little jar of it, Ken. Maybe you can improve the bass fishing there in Florida. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and the assault keeps coming, Jim. The assault. <laughs> oh. oh, by the way, I. I I think I speak for the FWC, the Florida Freshwater Fish Commission, when I say we want our bass back. <laughs> Put them back on one of those Navy planes and get them back here. You know, there, there was a period of time where, you know, I'd mentioned earlier that I had calls from around the country. I don't think I had more calls from any state more than Florida. I mean, people wow. were coming out here. Doug Hannon came out here. Everybody wanted to have a theory and, and, and do their thing. Writers, uh, cable bass fishing shows, everybody wanted a piece of this. And it was, you know, part of my job to try to divvy up that pie on an equitable basis, try to provide accommodation to the media. And, but I mean, I literally, put together a package. So when a fisherman called from another area, you know, of California or from Florida or Texas or the Tokyo Rod and Gun Club, which I hosted, yeah. uh, I would, you know, give them a list of the lakes, the hotels near them, their operating schedules. I'd set them up with the local tackle shops so that like when the Tokyo Rod and Gun Club came in, you know, we went to a tackle shop after hours so they could sort through things and deal with the staff there. And, you know, all, all that stuff was a great experience for me. I, I Just, really enjoyed promoting what we had here uh, as a don't world you just, class. I mean, in, in San in San Diego County, don't you just hand them a, a non-functioning Zebco 33 and a box of night crawlers? Isn't that pretty much how it's done <laughs> well uh, that was known as the zimmerly approach and uh i would say very fortunately it was highly limited to dave zimmer <laughs> hey, i'm sorry i interrupted terry's question about the trout anglers catching these giant yeah, okay bass. so yeah. Let me go on, yeah. give me give me some time here <laughs> so, terry, oh, man, I, you're I, an interview. I i remember those instances and I, I mean, I'll tell you some cra some even crazier things, but let's just start with the idea where it would say it was the fish was caught on a cheese ball or Zeke's or whatever. And I don't doubt that that happened uh, at some times. It happened more frequently at Wolford than anywhere else. I have to yeah. <laughs> was that Was that because they had a better trout population? It was a more popular trout fishery? <sighs> I don't really know. I couldn't say. I'd say Murray, Miramar, San Vicente, uh, Sweet, or not Sweet, uh, Wolford, later Dixon, Hinshaw even put in uh, trout for a while, Jennings, Quiamaca. Um, it, it, I asked the state to quit stalking DFG fish. Now, that might sound crazy for a lake manager to say he doesn't want any more fish. But it was really at the heart of the problem because the private hatchery fish that I ordered, I requested 16,000 pounds in San Vicente, 32,000 pounds in Murray, 32,000 pounds in Miramar, but for these fish specifically to be one pound and larger, just yep. on the basis that we didn't have a lot of giant bass swallowing those those trout, uh, and that a one pounder was going to be less vulnerable than the state's five to the pound rainbows. And I may or may not have been right in that theory. I think I could approve it in an aquarium because I've had a lot of aquariums with fish in them. <laughs> On the other hand, no. What shocking? Her. What you did, Jim, was you started the big swim bait craze right there, my friend. <laughs> yeah, he did. 
I, yeah, I think that, I think that's, guys that's, like Ken Huddleston and Alan Cole, uh, <laughs> they owe you money. Well, you know, those were actually, you know, years after this whole trout thing started exploding, including uh, the AC bait, you know, uh, which, quite frankly, if you look on the wall behind me, you'll see old lures. Uh, there have not been any new lures in the last 50 years, and I'll show you up here sometime. Uh, anything, you know, you being from the tackle industry, you know, everybody tries to reinvent some old idea. But most of those new ideas are still on this wall in my collection of antique baits. But uh, I'm right there with you. Yeah. I mean, you know, the AC plug is either a Lucky 13 or a head and zigwag that's been cut off and a plastic tail slammed on. But, you know, it's okay. Alan Cole came up with a great idea and did well with it. So, um, yeah, he did. Th- so, but but- what happened? I wanted to tell you, we were shocking Murray one night. And every bass, not every, almost every bass had at least one trout tail in it. Many had two and some had three. Now you imagine being in the shock boat and you're just taking these fish and you're marking them. So typically Larry would run the motor, Mike Limbeck or one of the other guys that worked for Larry would be on the net. Sometimes I'd be on the net. And mainly they wanted to humor me because I wasn't as good at it as those guys. Because being on the net was rough. I mean, you'd you'd be going down that shoreline, you'd step on the pulser. All of a sudden the bass would come up on either the inside or the outside electrode. And people are yelling at you, left, left, no, right, right, left. Because here's now six bass. And they're starting to come too. And so you're knitting as fast as you can. I did the best I could. And so, but just seeing at Murray, those trout jammed into the mouths of those bass was, was really, really stunning. And, uh, you know, at, the city no longer plants trout since I left. They no longer purchase trout for the lakes. Uh, the Department of Fish and Games stockings are very small. And so the city's l- programs at Murray and Miramar, Sam City, uh, the, the trout don't amount to much. I, I would say the ex- life expectancy of a trout put into those lakes is less than four or five days, and they're not caught by fishermen. Wow. They're caught by bass. And the less, they're caught by a fisherman because some of San Diego's best-known bass fishermen, big bass fishermen, in my opinion, we're some of our best trout fishermen. <laughs> so that's the Very question that I that I really have for you, uh, Jim, is when did you realize that there were guys out there bringing trout in or catching them at the lake and using them for bait? Was I, I that think, in the 60s or did, yeah, the, oh yeah. did that I, not happen until? I, I think pretty, pretty early on, especially, you know, in, in my job, I took over the City Lakes program in 74. All right. And so it was going on pretty well then. And I'd been managing Choyas Lake up until that point. And mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah, by the time I was there in 74, uh, the, the trout chuckers, as we derisively called them, were well known. And they accounted for the ma- vast majority of big bass caught. And that's one thing I was never willing to lie about. I I wasn't going to pretend. And there are any number of bass fishermen, trout chuckers, in San Diego who tried to start a guide business, who tried to get free tackle from tackle companies, who tried to get sponsored, who did not realize that tackle companies would call me and say, is this guy legit? And it was a no and a no and a no and a very occasional yes. So a lot of those guys are still wondering why they didn't get the big payoff for all of those big bass they caught on trout. And like I said earlier, I kind of like being a thorn in the side of the crooks. It was yeah. a passion. It, Good for to you. To be honest, it was a passion for me. So how many how many of those big fish in the 
late 60s to maybe the mid 80s when the swim bait craze came, how many of those big fish out of San Diego do you think came on trout? Well, I'll say the majority. Okay. So, wow. As an absolute statement, a majority. I couldn't tell you the percentage, but it was right. over 50. If a guy got caught uh, using trout as bait, uh, what was the penalty for that? Well, could you ban them from the num- city lakes? Number one, uh, no, no. Uh, number one, they would get a citation from the Department of Fish and Game, and those were few and far between. Uh, Fish and Game has never had enough wardens to even approach dealing with the problems that occur around right. these lakes. And uh, the, I worked closely with a lot of the wardens, and they did men and women that were, you know, pretty much had a thankless job uh, out there a lot of the times. And uh, so let's say they caught someone, and that person went to Muni Court to contest the c- citation. Judges in the Muni Court, they didn't understand what was going on. And so there was rarely much of a problem for them. They might fine them 50 bucks or something like that. So when you say penalty, the only penalty that stung was the word getting out. They were trout shuckers. So that hurt them with the legitimate fishermen, the legitimate shops, uh, the legitimate tackle companies. It didn't hurt them with their brethren. And it was a big gotcha. church. Wow. Can you name some yeah. fish that were that you know that were caught on trout? I know a lot of the fish that were caught on trout, but I don't know all of them, obviously. Mm-hmm. And it would be really unfair to me for me to give credit to one that I know about and not give credit to the other thieves. Um, yeah. there, there were just some really bad actors. Um, when, when you ask the question about when did I realize, imagine this. The whitewater trout farm folks that I did a lot of business with informed me of individuals coming to them and buying trout yeah. over there at their facility. They yeah, also... Happy Jacks. Happy Jacks, which I think was in Lytle Creek or something like that, they they were doing the same thing. Yeah, uh, and, and we we they they in, informed us there were two very well known lo- local bass fishermen who had a house with a pool in Lakeside filled with trout, and they were <laughs> using those trout and selling those trout to their friends. Wow. Yeah, That's no, crazy. And one of the best is that we told Fish and Game that the guys were already bringing in the trout. I mean, forget about the guys that could catch 30 or 40 DFG planters in the morning before they started bass fishing. Now we got guys bringing trout in on their own. Well, now Fish and Game has a real citation. It's illegal not to be unlicensed and move sport fish, okay? So right. they came in, and we just told them, yeah, go check that boat. Why would this guy have his aerator running while he's waiting in line for the gate to open? Yeah, um, exactly. We had busts of guys with uh, 40 trout in hidden in secret compartments in bass boats. Pretty Jeez. crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, you know, working at the shop in those years of 78 through 88, uh, you hear every week, you know, someone getting busted or, you know, someone got a a 17 or an 18 and, you know, yeah, that fish was caught on a trout. I mean, it was it wasn't until the swim bait, the the, the big swim bait deal happened that guys Mm -hmm. actually did not have the need to, to throw live bait or live trout anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, that really cleaned up the the big fish trophy fish deal down there. I I think Um, to a degree, I I think there's still people chucking trout, uh, you know, 
those trout are still a lot cheaper than adepts. So, you know, the, <laughs> the, you know, uh, now I, I obviously don't have the experience in, in the California bass fishing culture that you guys do. I've been there a couple of weeks. You guys have been decades there, but I have never seen such a toxic culture. Right. As those guys who, who chase the giant fish. Uh, if, if somebody catches a giant fish, oh, they're a cheater. They were using trout. They were fishing at night. They were there on a day it was supposed to be closed. It, it, it seems like the quickest way to be called out as a liar, a cheater, and a thief is to catch a big bass out in California. You is know, that, is that an overstatement? That, not at all. But what's missing in that statement is the secondary extension of it. And that is, if you legitimately caught a big bass, you were also under suspicion. And you that's guilty. Yes. Yeah, and so... You're guilty until proven innocent. And, yeah. and Terry and I had this uh, discussion in a series of texts, and uh, the whole big bass phenomena here got a lot of attention. But from my standpoint... It largely hurt bass fishing in San Diego. It largely hurt the sport of fishing in San Diego. And I was really resentful of that. And to be perfectly honest, I was not alone among people that worked on and around the lakes who said, by golly, if there's going to be a world record caught out of here, I hope it's some 12-year-old kid that people saw sitting down on the dock. And, you know, yeah. we were talking earlier did, about the uh, the bass. And did you ever do the research on the Garduno bass, Terry, uh, out of no. Miramar? I've okay. done some. The fish oh. that he, he netted. Yeah. Yeah. He, he I, netted I, that fish. As I had to investigate that. And it was just, it was just insane because, you know, people can't imagine, you know. So this guy puts a net down in the water. And another guy on the dock is teasing in a trout. What had, what had happened is when guys were reeling in a trout on the second fishing float at Miramar, this big bass was coming and hitting the trout. And guys were going, oh, my God, you know, that's pretty stunning. And <laughs> so they got the idea, we'll, we'll kind of lure him in. You know, he put this big long-handled net down there. We'll put the trout over the net and see if that bass will come get it and it did and so yeah for for folks who aren't familiar with the garduno bass it was 20 pounds four ounces 1990 johnny garduno claimed he caught it and uh jim is telling us the the real story yeah yeah and it, all of these guys it's kind of for some of them they were just crooks for garduna or garduna and others it was a crime of opportunity you know, it was holy cow! Look at the, look at this, and for people who think that's odd, bass attack trout on stringers. You know, people would have the stringer over the side, and say, "Look, yep. look at this thing's all the scales knocked off of it. It's all beat up. This bass followed me around as I drifted the shoreline." And so, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was fishing Casita this one time, and. We're back off of a break off a of deer slope, and I see this, you know, eight to ten inch trout just literally clear the water by two feet, and it comes back down to the water, and all of a sudden I see this V coming towards my boat, and this trout is sucked up against the boat, and this fourteen to sixteen pound fish just slams head first into the boat. I mean, yeah. it was, it was <laughs> unbelievable. We just sat there standing in awe of, of oh, what yeah. just happened and like you scale say there's scales floating in the water and i mean it was just bedlam. Yeah. don't, was don't crazy don't underestimate a bass and if anybody's ever had an aquarium they know that the, the rule yeah. among fish is that most fish that can get another fish in their mouth will so jim you mentioned at the top of the show uh that uh, after you had been in charge of the San Diego City Lakes for a number of years, that that your the appeal of bass fishing kind of waned for you. Oh, absolutely. Was all this cheating and opportunism was that part of what soured you a bit on it? 
Yeah, I, I was disgusted by the fact that we paid attention to all the big bass at the expense of recognizing the quality of the bass fishing as well as the fishing in general. So you can imagine every Monday morning and every Thursday, I was calling the various media, two local newspapers, Western Outdoor News, Hunting and Fishing News, and giving them a rundown. And all they want to know about are the biggest bass. And I'm reading off names of guys at San Vicente who are notorious trout chuckers. Yeah, this guy, uh, yeah, he said he caught it on a plastic worm. He said he caught it on a shiner. You know, so I, I did resent that a lot. And so I always wanted to push for people the, the fact that these were good fishing lakes. They happened to have really big bass. But I'm more in love with the sport of fishing and the sport of bass fishing. And I don't say that to diss you guys and the Big Bass podcast because you guys recognize there's a great deal of interest in that. And so that's not yeah, my uh, intention. But I want to explain why and where I am. Oh, I can understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, especially it, coming from your perspective, you're, although you're passionate about your bass fishing as a very young man, you enjoyed all aspects of fishing, freshwater, absolutely. saltwater, trout, bass, whatever. And, and to have, have found yourself in the midst of, of such an simultaneously interesting and toxic environment had to have impacted your attitude. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Well, and one other element of that, that I need, I should, should, actually kind of point out is that in my day, you evolved to become a bass fisherman. You first caught bluegill and crappie and bullheads, yeah. and then you caught some bass, and then you evolved as a bass fisherman. I deal, or I dealt with bass fishermen, uh, tournament fishermen, club fishermen, never caught a bluegill in their life. You know, they met a guy at work who had a bass boat and was really into bass fishing. They took him and, wow, I'm a bass fisherman now. And some of them became pretty good <laughs> bass fishermen. But, you know, no question about that. However, yeah. something happened with regard to having some respect for the other fishermen. And I proved this time and time again to different bass fishermen who would say, yeah, I was out at El Cap. Man, I got bananaed by a guy in a rental boat. You know, he came up close to me. He did this, he did that. And I said, hey, you want to meet over there Thursday morning? He goes, yeah, I'll bring my boat. Don't bring your boat. Don't bring your boat. Let's get in a rental boat. Go up there. Uh, let's go down to Caneos. And... Uh, Let's, let's throw some surface lures from the point going up into the arm. Okay. Who bananaed us? Every time, guys in bass boats. Yeah. Who cut between us and the shoreline when we were 20 yards off? Guys in bass boats. Who cut yeah. us off when we were on a, on a drift? Guys in bass boats. And so I had so many different experiences. You know, Bob Burgreen who is not really recognized. He should be in our San Diego Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Um, Bob was an avid bass fisherman, and he eventually became the police chief in San Diego and a very good friend of mine. And so when people complained about the water skiers going too fast at San Vicente, Burr Green sent a crew out with a radar gun. Now the real problem is the bass fishermen's guys. <laughs> so all, you know, I, I had such a peculiar job dealing with the bass clubs that we only have like 13 active bass clubs right now. I think we had 20 or 22 in the council of bass clubs. And I would get a call on a, you know, Monday morning and, and it would be a guy from club A complaining about club B. And those jerks did this and that. 
And then I'd hang up the phone and Club B would call. Did you hear about those guys from Club A? And I and that's how I got Burgreen. And we went to Jim Casebolt's garage, which happened to be <laughs> right next door to Harvey Naslin's house. And Harvey, and all the different clubs were there. And I told them they were their own worst enemies. That if I could, I would love to do a conference call of all their complaints to me about each other. So why didn't they try to form an organization have, and have some respect for each other? And instead of everybody hitting the same hot lake at the same time, come up with an agreed schedule to move around. And I did the same thing with the clubs in Orange and San Bernardino, and they formed a group for a while. And it worked really well. And I'll, I'll never forget, <coughs> somebody said, what should we call this? And I said, I'd call it the Council of Bass Clubs or the San Diego Bass Council. And Burgreen said, I like that. That's who we are. Yeah, and up in the L.A. area, we formed the Southern California Bass Council. Um, and it, it, we did exactly that. You know, we figured, A, that if we get all the clubs together, you know, we, we could lobby a lot better with Department of Fishing Game. But we also used it to de-conflict tournament schedules and, and things like that. And, you know, when, when you're talking about the San Diego lakes, especially, you know, at Castaic and Casitas, you know, you're at about 2,000 acres. But, I mean, you, you have lakes in, in San Diego that are, are tiny. They're 600 yeah, you, acres. You, you, well, it, you, 100, 140, 160 in yeah. the places of Marie and Miramar. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> it, it, you're on top of each other. and. You know, you can't put 500 boats on Miramar. It's impossible. Otai no. is impossible with 500 boats. I mean, you couldn't fish Miramar with 20 boats of people that know what they're doing no. and have them all happy. <laughs> it's, yep. it's just that way. But, uh, you know, you may not want this for the podcast, but on forming that group up in the Orange and uh, Riverside San Bernardino area, I worked with a very active guy. He was a one-armed bass fisherman, and I can't remember his name, and I bet you know Jerry him. Wallace? That might be it. He passed away some years ago. But he yeah, was, he, was a, he was a cop that had his arm shot off. Okay. So the, the, I, don't, I didn't know any of that, and I, it may not have been Gary Wallace, but the guy I worked with was very influential in his club, and they invited me up. And so I would come up, would drive up there to give presentations on – what I thought they were doing wrong uh, in terms of scheduling tournaments, and I co tried to coordinate them with the San Diego clubs. And uh, it was pretty effective for a while while people, you know, still wanted to cooperate with each other. And yeah. uh, it, it went pretty well. I, I just, it wasn't Wallace, but um, uh, if you think back, I'm sure you've got a file on this guy somewhere. Look, and look at the one arm file. And, right. <laughs> But no, he was he was really a sincere, good guy to work with, and and it was great. And and you know, I I would go to the clubs and give them my thoughts on catch, carry, cull, and kill release fishing, which is what I described their approach to fishing as. And uh, they didn't always like it, but I had the data that was developed both in Texas by Edgar uh, Seidenstecker, fisheries bass biologist, and Larry, showing mortality rates on the bass we catch. And they, their data coincided between the two states in terms of when the water temperature hits a certain point, you can expect this to happen. When you keep a bass in a live well a certain amount of time, you can expect this to happen, you know. And so Larry and I were very direct with people who were holier than thou. Some didn't like it. Most respected what we told them. Oh, Larry was a god. I mean, so we would have a tournament, you know, down on Hodges, or we would have a tournament at San Vicente. And Larry was there for every weigh-in. And, and a lot of the times we used Larry's scales because they were way more accurate than our club scales. You know, we could only afford to get ours calibrated once a year. And yeah. Larry's were probably calibrated once a month. Yeah. I... And every single fish that went on the scale was examined by Larry and, and one of his helpers. 
it, it just blew me away, even at the age of you know 17 or 18 years old, how much you guys cared about your fish and your lakes. Yes. No, I mean, um, for me, when you're a kid growing up and you do the same kind of reports, like I did two reports from the sixth grade through college. I either did a report on how to make the San Diego River a better resource for San, for the citizens of San Diego or how to improve the San Diego City Lakes. Those were the reports I wrote. And as I had mentioned to you in a text, from the time I was a teen, it was my vision that I would eventually write the Angler's Guide to the Inland Waters of San Diego County, because I fished most of those that had fish and all of those that don't. <laughs> wow. All of those that don't. I like that. Well, Jim, we've <laughs> talked a lot about some of the guys who, who brought bass fishing and the trophy hunting into disrepute uh, a couple of names maybe come to mind for you as guys who are really a credit to the sport who who you admired as anglers you know i think pappy wade bill pappy wade uh was a guy who uh you know really tried to bring ethics to the first bass club here in san diego and that was pisces and yep. he really wrestled with the fact that some of his fellow club members were poachers or, you know, did one thing or another. And um, he had a real sense of ethics to be applied to fishing. And he was a very good big bass fisherman as well. Um, there were others uh, that I thought played an important role Uh Junior Williams was was one. He there were two sets of terrific bomber fishermen in San Diego. So Dad Yost and his son. So Dad Yost had Dad's bait and tackle in Chula Vista, and they built custom rods and coffee grinders for cranking 600 series bombers, which were very popular for quite a while. And then Junior Williams had a partner, and so. You know, they had an influence as this transition, as we saw that transition of northern bass to Florida's, you know, begin to develop. And uh, in due time, the we saw the preference of anglers in fishing for bass really switch away from a lot of the hard baits. I mean, when the plastic worms came in, uh, the bear hair jigs, uh, you know, they, they really changed the fishing. Uh, Red DeZeo had a, a big influence. Ken Madden, Marlon Grant. These were guys most people didn't know about, and they were really good, you know, big bass fishermen. Um, I, I, I've, I always felt that uh, Bill... Uh, help me with the name, guys. Bill... Bill Murphy. Bill Murphy. Yeah. Was Lunker Bill. <laughs> yes, yeah. Who credited my dad with teaching him to structure fish. Um, he was a guy who would be kind of on the edge of tears. You know, he'd come down to my office after fishing San Vicente. And, Jim, why can't you do something? This guy and that guy and this guy and that guy are trout chuckers. And, you know, I'm out there trying to get a bite on my, my crawdads or my jigs. And, you know, I can see what these guys are doing, and they're getting all the attention. And, you know, Bill was overwrought with angst as, as a result of that. I don't I don't think Bill was ever a guy who would uh, uh, throw a trout. But he was a guy who, if the fog came in and the staff couldn't see where his boat was, it would kind of drift into the restricted area. <laughs> <laughs> Which, okay, so all, all of the lakes in San Diego, they have a buoy line that keeps you from going towards the dam. Specifically and, towards the outlet tower. It's a, it's, yeah. a health, it's a health department standard that they impose on us. And so... Oh, I, I was unaware of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. They, it's, it's such a peculiar thing. The way that is stated is they did not want public contact within 700 feet 
or a 30 day water supply, whichever was greater. You know, we uh, yet, yet they have the fish answer. swimming around in the water and pissing and crapping. Oh, yeah. None of us knew the answer to that, but we had to put the buoy <laughs> line at 700 feet or the health department would do a report. We were out of compliance. In yeah. fact, if someone died in a reservoir, there was an automatic the the filter plant, even if the body was recovered three miles from the outlet tower, just as a matter of. I don't know, perception. They wanted no water going through that filter plant for 24 hours. So the other filter oh plants gosh. would have to cover, you know, those areas with changing the the uh, water distribution. Yeah, there were a lot of things that people don't realize. But I'll tell you a funny thing about restricted areas. And that is, I don't care where on a lake you have a restricted area, bass fishermen are absolutely certain that's where you're keeping the bass. And it, <laughs> it is so... Well, well, everybody knows that, Jim. <laughs> Come on. It's, it's, <laughs> you, get a, you, get, you get against the buoy line, you push as far in toward it as you can with your electric motor, and then you make a long cast. That's right. That's right. We've, you, you, bring we've a, all done it. you bring a saltwater outfit, <laughs> put light line on it, and you throw a, you know, whatever. It... it Eight-pound test on a surf rod. Yeah. No, the whole thing is the psychology and nature of fishermen might be your next podcast to work on because <laughs> it's. Okay. I think in the big, in the long run, it's more interesting. <laughs> Are you surprised that California has not produced a world record largemouth bass? No. No. Are you disappointed that, not a, that not a, California not at all. has not produced? Not at all. I'm not disappointed. Um, if it does, great. If it does, it's probably the result of a bold experiment that first took wing in 1959. That's great, too. Um, but in terms of worrying or being concerned about that, um we know very few bass in history have ever exceeded 20 pounds. Um, I've read lots of conjecture that people say, well, George Perry's 22-4. Oh, my gosh, we don't know if that was legit and blah, 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 blah. Fishermen never know <laughs> if anybody else's fish was ever legit. So it's it's hard to, hard to figure. I just, I hate to see the emphasis go there, Ken compared to, wow, we have pretty darn good bass fishing. Yeah, and so my question to you now is what happened to the fisheries? Because, you know, back in the in the 70s and even through the 80s, you heard of a lot of big fish coming out. And then it, it kind of hit an upswing in the early two, late 90s, early 2000s. And now we're, you know, since 2010, we're, we're back in a valley again. If they're not producing those fish. Yeah, um, I'll go a step further before you before you answer, Jim. Uh, last year, I did an article for a magazine, and I, I had an opportunity to talk about uh, record class fish in California. I called several state fisheries biologists. All of them told me there is not a world record fish swimming in California, a largemouth. That I, I think, I think that's a real problem. For that answer, just from the standpoint, they don't know, and I don't know, and it's always a possibility. And maybe Dave Zimmerly's bass was one season away from being the world record. Um, maybe yeah. Gene Tupra's bass was. I don't know. Um, so to say that absolutely... Yeah, they can say whatever they want. I don't think anyone can. But I will say this, and I agree with what Terry was saying, that that we've seen a decline, you know, in the number of big bass. Things are have changed a good bit out there. And what a lot of people don't look at, and it's painful for us who advocate catch and release fishing is the fact there's virtually 
minimal take of bass in California. Minimal. Even before I retired, you know, Larry's data would show, you know, 140 bass caught, 10 kept. That's 130 released, you know, most of the yeah. fish being released. Um, a lot of people, you know, theorize that in a sense, the lakes are overpopulated with bass. The competition is extreme. And, um, you know, it, so I, I've been, re it'll be in August. I will have been, or July, I'll have been retired for 20 years. I see it, still get Jeez. calls asking me, when are we stocking a lake? Uh, what, <laughs> is it going to be open on Veterans Day? I can't understand why people still have my phone number or I haven't. <laughs> but, but well, now, I, th I think a lot of people are reluctant to keep bass in California because you gave bass the right to vote a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're doing a good job, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I it, we, we we could debate that. It's it is uh, it is so crazy, um, but but I I mean, there we're looking based on what people are telling me because I'm not out there. But I have guys tell me, Jim, the size of the bass or the condition of the bass is declining. We're not mm. seeing heavy gutted bass. Well. Part of that's the lack of trout going trout. into the lakes. Yeah. I can say yep. that in, out of, in the same sentence that I can say, well, we sure had an exception at Hodges. But, yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing less. But the, the lakes that are planting plenty of trout, Lake Dixon, which is very much like a Murray or Miramar. You're talking about a small terminal reservoir, clear water, uh, heavy trout plants. Like 70 acres. Yeah. Yeah, so you and know, only one real outlier from Dixon. Yeah, um, I, I Terry, I got one more question. I got two more questions. One I'll ask right now, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, I've monopolized the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Jim, what is what would you say is the biggest misconception that people have about what we'll call the uh, the San Diego Florida bass experiment? Biggest misconception. Gosh, um, maybe there are none. Well, as fishermen, we are naturally prone to some misconception. Um, I'm trying to, to think, you know, early on, it was that the Florida bass were going to be no different. And I think at some point we're going to do a podcast on those early differences that we saw and why Florida bass, uh, why a couple hundred Florida bass take over a couple thousand northern bass in a few years. There's biological reasons how that happens. Um, as far as misconceptions, oh gosh, you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I can't really think of, of any right now. I mean, I, 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 I I'd be hard pressed, Ken, but I'll 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 think about it before we talk again. Please, I'm just curious because usually when you're talking to somebody who is who has seen as much and done as much as Jim Brown in the world of, of trophy bass, uh, there's usually something out there that that people are saying that's not quite right. Well, and uh, you, I, we can go back to the trout thing. All the big bass are caught on trout. No, they're not. Majority probably were during the heyday. <laughs> but maybe not so much anymore. And I, and I think, Terry, and you made a good point in the, the, the swim bait culture uh, coming in on that. Um, so that's a misconception. Another misconception is that they're just bass lakes. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've only, I'm not a biologist, but I've lived my life between biologists like Orville and, and Larry and worked with both of them. Uh, with Orville, I, I was a student intern for years for him. And I had one great idea. Uh, you, you'll probably cut it out of the podcast. Uh, I was sitting here thinking one day, if the Florida strain bass have been so different, and we're finding that our panfish populations are really suppressed in the lakes, again, 
probably owing to the Florida strain bass. Well, if Florida has good bluegill and crappie fishing with those subspecies having evolved with those Florida bass, why wouldn't we try those panfish? So Larry said, Jim, we can do that. That's an idea. So he went to a lake in the Riverside area and said, I'm going to bring back Florida black nose crappie because our crappie populations were just very cyclical, which crappie are anyway, but cycling on the bottom, never the top. And so we weren't seeing good populations. And so Larry went to this lake and he goes, it also has the Florida stream bluegill. And he goes, but I'm going to get the, the crappie. And I said, I, God, I think the bluegill, heck, what difference does it make? You know, it, survival of the yeah. fish. Well, it turns out we don't have any data to show that the, the Florida black nose crappie changed the complexion of our crappie populations. But I can point to the state record Florida strain bluegill being caught at Otai within a few years. And Florida yeah. strain bluegill now appearing to live more harmoniously based on their numbers and size in all of our reservoirs. So that's been a yeah. pretty cool uh, thing. It's the only thing that I've <laughs> contributed biologically. Once again, <laughs> Florida genetics dominating. Yeah, it's that copper, that copper head or... Yeah, I think it's copper. Well, and I think it's that bald head thing you were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and and nobody understood that until they brought those fish out there. And I mean, I fished Paris one time, and my partner and I we had thirteen bluegill that went forty-seven pounds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was insane catching them in thirty feet of water on crickets on four pound line. Yeah. yeah, that was a phenomenal bluegill fishery, and it was the same thing. Those Florida bluegills went out there and, you know, yeah. did what they did what they did in sunny Southern California and, you know, ha not having to deal with, you know, Florida. Yeah, I'm, they just I, get fat and lazy when they go to California. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you uh, get EBT cards and the whole nine yards. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm really uh, – I try to be very judiciously careful – to ensure that credit and commentary on the biological aspects is given to Larry primarily and also to yeah. Orville, but primarily to Larry for his unbelievable work with the fisheries here. And uh, I have no doubt if I'd not hired him away California would be number one in Stevens kangaroo rats. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <-hoo. laughs> wow! That's wow! Awesome. Oh, geez. Well, well hey, uh, you know, is this uh, is this a point where we should uh, maybe? I, yeah, Ken had a. Yeah, question. I think we. we okay. Well, you know, well, my question was this, Jim. You've been wonderful. You've been so gracious with your time. Will you come back and do another couple dozen shows with us? <laughs> well, a couple dozen. Yeah, uh, sure. I might be exaggerating about a couple dozen, but a few shows with us. Uh, ab absolutely. Because, um, you know, you mentioned misconceptions. And I would like to be able to say, from my perspective, which is unlike any other. I mean, I, I just don't know of anybody as privileged it's as I've been in the world of fishing in San Diego. And so, yeah, I, I do like to, to, to work with that issue. And uh, I, I really wish you guys well with your, your podcast efforts. And I, I'm going to be following it and hoping it's very awesome. successful. Well, you hear that, Terry? We got a listener. Awesome. At least we got one. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's yeah. a thousand percent more, infinitely, you know, higher than what we had starting this. <laughs> <laughs> what a so, great day it's been. Thank you so much, Jim. Yeah. Just, you're, you're a delight. My pleasure, man. guys. So, and... so much information. Yeah. So, so fascinating. It, it, it's, uh, I wish I knew something about anything else, but I, I'm a little limited. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you 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 found a home with us at the Big Bass Podcast because that's what we're going to be doing a hundred percent of our shows on. So, well, guys, I re- I really appreciate it, and I'm I'm really sincere. I I think, you know, getting accurate information out there is is incredibly important, and I'm so impressed by the research that both of you have done. Your your files and and your background knowledge exceeds anyone that I've ever spoken to. And that includes people who've done extensive stories on the lakes. <laughs> well, we appreciate it, Jim. And, uh, you know, un- until next time, uh, you know, thank you again for, for, you know, spending an hour and a half with us. And, uh, you know, we ho- hope to talk to you soon. So Sounds um, great, guys. Awesome. All right. Cool. And goodbye, Nathan. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> All right. <laughs>